Good morning, Rubina here at Lifeline Heart of Worship. How are y'all this morning? Let's welcome our online family. Yes, we are just minutes away from receiving what God has for us today. First, we're going to praise, we're going to worship. And let me tell you, this week of gratefulness, how many in the house are grateful? Yes, we are really so grateful of everything the Lord is doing, not just here in Lifeline, but in our families, in our homes, in our community. And we are so grateful, like I just said. And do me a favor, as you are listening, drop a comment, say hello to us. Or if you have a prayer, if something has been gnawing just in your heart, in your spirit, drop us a comment. Tell us what your prayer is. Go to our prayer wall. If you have not downloaded our app, please do so. There is a prayer team that is in constant view of all your prayer requests. And let me tell you, not only your prayer requests, but your praise reports. We rejoice with you. So also, I don't know if you've been uh, joining us or teaming along in our Philippians series. We also have been having these readings that have been so powerful. Anybody in the house following us also? Yes. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just do a rewind and check out our previous um, sermons and you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so let's get started. I just, from our family to yours, I just wanna wish you a very, very happy Thanksgiving and be blessed and get re- get ready to receive what the Lord has for you today. Amen. with you really quickly before we start. Good morning. I'm so glad you are here in the house of the Lord today. I don't know what thoughts you've been thinking or what's been circling in your mind, but it says in 2 Corinthians that we capture every thought to make it obedient to God. What does that mean? When I have doubt, I am reminded that he is faithful and that he is a God that provides, a God that heals, a God that restores. When I have ashes in my hands, his word says that he turns it to beauty. When I'm sad, his word promises joy. So I don't know what thoughts have been circling, but today we capture it and we make it obedient to his promises. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give him praise today? We thank you, Jesus. Are we sing when night is falling? When night is falling and fear is coming and still you're calling me When faith is lost and my hope exhausted and you will be my strength When my mind and when my mind says I'm not good enough God you're enough for me And I've decided
pleasing You keep repeating Your promises to me Now there's no stopping Where you have started Till it is complete With my mind And with my mind hallelujah right now can we just thank him for what he's done we thank you lord for the breath in our lungs we thank you lord for the joy in our hearts and we just praise your name king jesus we just give you thanks in this time of thanksgiving let us be fixated on giving you thanks not food or the cowboys or football or anything like that let us just be fixated on you god so today we lift up our voices and we praise and we worship your name why don't you get your hands together Hallelujah In the presence of my enemies And now raise a hallelujah And louder than the unbelief And now raise a hallelujah Oh, it's your weapon And my weapon
know about you, but this week has been a test about declaring things over my life and refusing to let the devil tell my mind something that's not the truth. Anybody else this week? Yeah. So we're just gonna speak Jesus because at the name of Jesus, demons have to flee. They don't, they don't get a choice at the name of Jesus, amen? All right, come on. Would you just lift your hands and we're just gonna sing this over ourselves or over your family or over whoever you're praying for. Sing it over somebody this morning. Jesus from the mountains when we're at the top when we're at 
the top, we're feeling good, we're gonna shout Jesus. In the streets, when we're at our lowest church, we're gonna shout the name of Jesus because it doesn't matter no what we look like. It doesn't matter what our situation looks like. He is the one that has control, amen?
for this movie that's coming out. And um, this guy is, is at the table like this and he's praying. And the guy across from him is like, what are you doing? Oh, look, he's praying. Oh, look, he believes in the name of Jesus. And all the while, the other guy is sitting here, in Jesus' name, I am who you say I am. I am washed in the blood, I am cleansed. And the other guy is like, you know you're nothing. You know you're just trash. You know that you're tainted because of what you've done, because of your past. And this is the stuff that goes through our mind, church. And if we give it one inch, it can take us a mile. But if we give Jesus our all, amen? But if we give Jesus our all, and as soon as the, and the scene ends with this guy and he says, this guy is yelling at him. And as soon as this guy says amen, there's silence. And he looks up and the guy is gone, disappeared. Amen. It's just like the scripture says, in the name of Jesus, every demon has to flee. I don't know why I can't get off of that this morning, but I feel like somebody in here this morning needs to speak Jesus over that thing. And when I say that thing, I know you know in your heart what, what it is that thing is. Amen. So can we just fight this morning? Our weapon is our melody. Our worship is our melody. You think the devil wants to see us praise when we're in our situation? Mm -mm. But we're gonna show him we're gonna do it anyways. Amen? Because this is how we fight. At the name of Jesus, he gives us authority to use his name to fight. Would you just raise your hands with me and fight this morning?
lift up a shout of praise this morning. Come on, I dare you to lift up a shout of praise this morning. Come on, lift up a shout of praise this morning. If you don't praise them, the rocks will cry out. Is that all you got this morning? Is that all you got this morning? Do you feel his presence in this place? So if you're new and you're trying to figure out what in the world is going on in this place, oh man, it's not the music. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. If you're trying to put your, 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 your thoughts together, well, what's going on? I've never felt this before because this is the presence of the Most High God. This is why we do what we do. We're so grateful for what the Lord is doing. We're so grateful because we're not where we used to be. We're grateful because we know he has a plan and purpose for our life. If you are here for the very first time, would you just kind of wave at me right there where you're at? God bless you, sir. Welcome to Lifeline. Welcome to Lifeline. Welcome to Life. Welcome to Lifeline. Welcome to Lifeline. Welcome to Lifeline. This is how we fight our battles. My Lord, good job there, praise and worship. Good job, heart of worship. And so, yeah, so you get these thoughts coming in. I, I, I'm, on, I'm on your page because last night I was having some thoughts about our project and this and that. And again, finance is always a thing, right? And then I just got to turn back and say, God, this is you, man. This is you. This isn't my house we're building. This is your house we're building. And so you got to bless your people. You got to bless your people. And I, and I just want to show you, they're going to show you some clips and some videos. You can start that whenever you're ready. I just want to show you how far this is going because we have our youth literally one by one. We are speaking the name of Jesus over their life. Literally over 80 plus kids got together and felt the presence of God. And I'm telling you, the enemy tried to come in and, and literally just come in and destroy and try to do these things. But the devil is a liar. And so literally you see that and then you see it's going into the schools, right? We're going into the school speaking to every single individual. We are dropping seeds. We are dropping seeds of hope, seeds of faith. We are dropping seeds. I, I don't think you understand what I'm saying. We are speaking Jesus to people one by one by one by one. And sometimes you don't speak it. Sometimes you just got to serve. And you serve the people of the community. Do they come to your church? It doesn't matter. You continue to serve the community. You continue to serve the needy. You continue to serve the greedy. You continue to serve the selfish. You continue to serve the grateful. Because Jesus died for you. And if you think this is just local, let me just kind of break it to you. Here you see the church in Argentina who is trying to raise $160,000 to finish their church project. And I said, you know how much we need? We need $700,000 more. But you know what? We're going to sow into this ministry. And this is Argentina so that this church can be blessed. Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying your generosity goes a long way. We're touching the young ones. We're touching the old ones. We're touching the Rio Grande Valley. We're touching Argentina. We're touching people in Uganda. You're... So do you think the enemy's going to stay with his arms crossed? Oh no, he's coming with everything he's got. But I don't fight my battles uh, with, with a voice. I don't fight. I fight my battles with my hands up, lifting the praise. So I wonder if I have 15 people right now who can say, Pastor, we stand with you. We are with you. We love what we're doing. Come on. Come on. I wonder if I got 20 crazy people in here. I'm not telling you to praise him because he got no problems. I'm telling you to praise him because he's got the victory.
Though we say all that, to say thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your generosity. Like I said, we are literally can say we're reaching the world. We will be blessing another church. I'm not going to mention the names yet because I want them to receive their Bibles. And once they receive their Bibles, we'll show you pictures of that. But we're going to reach another across, across, across where even where we're at. People who, who literally all they want is the Bible. The things you and I take for granted. Your generosity is making it possible. So we say thank you. Our house, his house, I shouldn't say our house, his house is getting built. We're in the details. We're getting close. The enemy's trying to get in there. Uh-uh, he don't realize that, that, again, he don't realize that what, that building, yeah, it's going to be great, but it's the presence of God. We are the church. So we welcome you to Lifeline Heart of Worship. I'm Pastor Pepe. I'm the lead pastor here, and we're just grateful that you joined us today. We've been on Philippians. I don't know if you've been enjoying that series. Pastor Peter's going to come up and just bring in week three, chapter three. It's going to be powerful. I'm excited. I hope you're excited. Are you excited? All right, well then, with all, with all that said, do me a favor, and you have a chance right now to connect with your neighbor, talk to your neighbor, and say, hey, I speak Jesus over your life. Bless them, hug them, high-five them, tell them something good, tell them something great about their mother-in-law, I don't know. Say something, say something, do something. I love you all. Let's get ready to hear the Word of God. today I'm gonna have to match y'all's energy today <laughs> I remember one time pastor came uh, when we were at, when I were at our previous church I remember you came to see us preach and you were visiting and I, I never forget you're like man you're a, you're a good teacher I was like am I that calm <laughs> when I preach <laughs> I was like pastor preaches pastors on fire I was like I gotta match your energy pastor so I'm gonna try to bring it today um, y'all ready Hey, man, it's good to be in the house of God. Well, let's welcome my online family. Can you just shout them out real quick? Give them a hand clap. Online family, thank you for joining us today. I know you're watching from all over the world, like Pastor said. From I think we have Kenya East, Kenya West. I'm learning them. Uganda, Belize, and Pakistan, and Argentina. And then plus everybody who's watching from the RGV, which, which you should be in the house unless you can't medically. But next time, couldn't join us. We got a whole upper area here that's just waiting for you to be filled because the bottom is packed. And um, wherever else you're watching from, thank you for joining us online. We love you. You are a part of Lifeline as well. So like Pastor said, we've been in this series called Philippians. We've never done a book as a church. We're actually been doing, we've been doing like Bible study, but at the same time preaching it because that's who we are as a church. We preach it. We're excited about God's word. And Pastor spoke part one. Would y'all remember the, the, the title of that? It was called Joy in Living for Christ. That was part one. Then part two, we went to Joy in Serving Christ in Unity, where we talked about the attitudes that we should have. Y'all remember that? That we're supposed to have Christ, the attitude of Christ. And one of the most famous verses in, in, in the Bible is in chapter two, where it says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that we've been talking about right now, speak the name of Jesus, that Jesus is Lord. Amen. 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 And so today we're going to go into chapter three. I'm going to read you the verse and, and I'm going to read it in three different translations just so we can kind of capture it right before we get into it. But Philippians 3, 8. <clears throat> in the first, we're going to read it in the NLT. I think it is. And it goes like this. 
It goes, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. It says, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So this one talked about the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. Now, Philippians 3, 8 in the Amplified Version, one of my favorite versions is this. It says, but more than that, I count everything as a loss compared to the priceless privilege and the supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, and of growing more deeply and thoroughly acquainted with him. Did y'all hear that? It's a joy unequaled. And then Philippians 3, 8 in the NLT, I think this is the NLT, and it says, yes, everything else is worthless. You hear that language? It's worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus. Today, we're going to speak from the subject, the joy in knowing Christ, the joy in knowing Christ your Savior, the joy in knowing your God, the joy in knowing the one that you put your faith in, the, know, the, the joy in knowing the one that you put your hope in. You hear me? I'm talking about the joy. There's a joy to that. And I gotta, I gotta emphasize joy because some of us can be Christians that are walking around with such a lack of joy when you have everything that you have gained by just knowing Jesus. Just by knowing Him. Just by being in his presence like we've been talking about here in worship and how pastor mentioned there is a joy to knowing him and i know sylvia said we've been talking about speaking that we've been singing that right speak the name of jesus speak the name in order to speak the name of jesus you have to know jesus you gotta know him you got you you can't really speak on something that you don't know you can't speak on it Maggie, my wife does this all the time. Like I go on this little, like pastor right now, he mentioned in the, in the, uh, when we talked to our leaders at four before the floor, he was talking about how he's gotten into this new uh, thing where he's in the F1, right? F1, the F1 racing, in case you know about F1 racing. Okay, nobody does. Okay. We just know about the Cowboys, those Cowboys. <laughs> we get more... Oh, y'all know about the joy about the Cowboys, but I'm talking about the joy about Jesus today. We, 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 get, we get more claps about the Cowboys. I don't know. We got we to gotta change that. Go Niners. Oh. <laughs> but you got to know, you got to know, you got to know who Jesus is. You got to know who he is. Amen. Before you speak, you, you, you got to know that he's your savior, right? You, you, you got to, sometimes we, li we, we live in the, these worlds, in, in this world and in this state and in this mindset, like Sylvia was talking about, where you're kind of paralyzed and where you're stuck and, and you wish that you can get out of that. But it's because you don't know Jesus. You know, you, 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 you know of, you have experience, you have moments, but it's, you got you to gotta know that he's a healer. You got to know that, that he can take every thought captive. Those thoughts that you got to know that, that you're no longer bound to those chains because he has there's freedom where Jesus is and you are set free. You got to know. You got to know that God can restore your life. You got to know that your future is bright because God, there's a hope and a future in Jesus. And when you be when you begin to know, you see, when you begin to know who he is, your life, you begin to live different. You begin to have this joy that is unequaled, that surpasses everything else, that everything else is worth garbage, that everything else is worth trash. It's trash like the like Gen Z says it. It's trash. Everything else is trash. When it comes to knowing Jesus, amen? So we're going to go into a little bit about Jesus in this Bible study. So let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you, God for your word we thank you for your word we thank you for it because the grass fades and the flower withers but your word stands forever and that's what we stand on we stand on your word and so we ask that every time we get into this room God and every time we get into your word and, and in conversations with you that you can reveal to us Jesus who you are your purpose for our lives because we need you in Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Give somebody a high five. You can take your seat. 
And um, the joy of knowing, knowing, knowing Jesus. Like I was talking about my wife earlier. Sometimes like pastors into F1 right now, sometimes I go into these things of like knowing things. And I can be talking about these things and, and, and talking about like one of the recent conversations we had is like my wife shaking my head. <laughs> and uh, I, I love coffee, and I do my research on coffee, and I'm, I'm talking about coffee, and I'm like, coffee this and coffee that. And she's like, you don't even own an espresso machine. <laughs> and I'm like, shut up. I done the research. I know. <laughs> you know? And so I, I, I know things, but I don't have those things. <laughs> So Lord, bless me with an espresso machine. <laughs> but it's about, it's about knowing, knowing Jesus, right? It's about knowing him. And I feel like sometimes that our relationship could be like that. It's like, God, like, I, I know some things about you. I, I, I know a little bit about you. I feel your presence. It, it feels beautiful. But there's a joy. There's a joy. And in Philippians 3, it, it, I, I want to go real brief on the, in, on, on the first beginning verses. We're going to try to get through, through those really quick. Philippians 3, 1 and 2 says this. You know, before we, we read that, one of the, I wanted to mention this, David, one of the things that he mentioned in the psalm, the psalmist was, it says, return to me the joy of my salvation. Return to me the joy. So maybe you're here today, maybe you don't have joy. You, you're a follower of Jesus. You, 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 you pray to Jesus. You believe in Jesus, but maybe you're lacking joy. My, my, my prayer today is that, is that your joy returns. Because there's, there, there's nothing more miserable than a joyless believer. Uh, like, there's nothing worse that you have everything. And what I mean you have everything is when you have Jesus, you have everything. I'm not talking about materialistic things, but that you have everything, but you're living a life that's miserable. You're living a life that's joyless. Paul, he writes this letter, like Pastor said, he's writing from jail. He's, been, he's, the, he's the apostle that got you know, beaten and bruised and in jail multiple times, but he, he writes this letter with so much joy. <clears throat> and uh, it's the guy who, like, exuberates just joy in his life through his writing. And so Philippians 1 and 2 puts it like this. It says, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, he says, rejoice in the Lord. He says, rejoice. I'm in jail. I'm in rejoicing. Hey, brothers and sisters, you also rejoice. He says, I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. And I love that because he, it seems like a theme that Paul is writing in every letter. In every letter, in, in to, when he writes to the Colossians, you know, we, we spoke about Jesus over everything. And that kind of was like out of the book of Colossians. And we're, 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 he's, when he's writing to that, when he's writing to the Ephesians, he's, he's always writing to them. And he's thanking them. And he's telling them about their relationship. But here he's like, hey, I never get tired of telling you these things. Because I feel like Paul's like saying, man, I keep telling you these things over and over. These basic things about the faith, or I, I just have to warn you and I have to bring you these warnings. And I just want to let you know that our church is never going to get tired of preaching the gospel. Our church is never going to get tired about preaching about Jesus. Our church is never going to get tired about preaching about faith, hope, and love, and forgiveness, and salvation, and hope, and a future. We are never going to get tired about preaching about the one who has saved us. Amen. We're not going to get tired about preaching about the death, burial, and resurrection. We're not going to get tired tired about preaching about his second coming we are not going to get tired we preach this whole book and we're not going to get tired about it and so he's saying these things in 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 philippians but then he goes on to verse two and he says watch out for the dogs those people who do evil they might be thinking whoa what are they doing and so he explains this those mutilators who say look at who he calls evil who say you must be circumcised to be saved <clears throat> So here we go. If you remember when we talked about Colossians, in Colossians we said Jesus over everything uh, in August. And then we were talking about how he was preaching to the Colossians and warning them and say, hey, it's not Jesus plus something. No, it's Jesus plus nothing. It's just Jesus that gets you salvation. Because they were saying, hey, no, you got to add this and you got to add that and you got to add. And here he's doing the same thing. But what he was doing is Paul planted this church. He started this church. And then he leaves. And then the people are like, I know Paul said about Jesus can save you. Yeah, but remember, you still got to get circumcised. Because that was, a, that was something that, that would happen in the past. It was a tradition that in order for you to be saved, you had to do that. 
the men had to do that. And so he's like, he come, he's like, hey, these are the evil people. These are the dogs. Who let the dogs out? <laughs> Paul's like, who let these dogs out? <laughs> and he calls them dogs. He's like, no, we don't add to the gospel. It's just Jesus. And then verse 3 puts it like this. He says, for who we worship by the Spirit of God. For who? For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. He's like, I know you're talking about they still have to do that. No. He says, we rely on Christ Jesus alone for what he has done. We put no confidence in human effort. That's human effort. When, in other words, when you have to do something to receive God. And remember, we've talked about this before. You don't do anything to receive God. Grace is a gift. All you have to do is believe it and receive it. You don't have to add anything else to it. And Paul is just preaching against this. And he's like, hey, we're circumcised by, in our hearts. In other words, we cut out all the old junk away to receive Jesus. Jesus cuts all that out. He says, we don't rely on ourselves. We rely on just Jesus. And see, we are people that rely on the Spirit of God, on the Spirit of God, on the Holy Spirit. That's who we rely on. We build our marriages by the Spirit. We build our churches by the Spirit. We build our services by the Spirit. We parent by the Spirit. We work by the Spirit. We serve by the Spirit. We should be doing everything by the Spirit because we are people of, that live by the Spirit of God. Philippians 3, 4, and 6 says like this. It says, Though I, could, though I could have confidence in my own effort. So remember, he's like, he's saying, he's saying, we don't put confidence in human effort. But me, Paul, if somebody could have confidence, it's me. And he goes, he goes on this litany of things that he did. He said, indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. He says, I was circumcised on the, at, at eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a real Hebrew. If there ever was one, I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded strict who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. You got to remember that these people, this him, who he's a part of, who he's talking about, they would memorize the first five books of the Bible called the Torah. They would memorize. You're talking about walking Bible. Some of us can't memorize a verse. You're like, I know a verse. God is love. Thank good for you, bro. God is love. Three words. Come on, somebody. We got we to gotta, we gotta quote more than that verse. Christians, you all proud. God is love. <laughs> Learn another verse. So he, he's, <laughs> Jesus wept. Two words. <laughs> I'm going to I'm I'm quiz you on the lobby next week. What verse do you know? <laughs> Y'all ain't coming next week to church, right? You're like, where's Pastor Peter? You're like, walking out the door. <laughs> this was Paul. Paul was somebody who would say, man, if I could put confidence in my own effort, remember, because he's trying to break that. It's not about your effort. It's not about what you do. Just believe and receive, and God will transform you. You're talking about the Christian killer. This is the guy who would kill Christians. He, believed, he thought he was so right in his mind the, that what he believed, he's like, I believe. Now, remember, he believed in God so much. The Jews believe in God so much that they die for God. They do anything for God, but they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They were still waiting for somebody else. I don't know who they were waiting for, but they're like, this can't be Jesus. He is a liar. That's why they crucified him, because they did not think that he was the Messiah, the Christ. And they're like, nah. This ain't him. So what he would do is whoever, they believe in Jesus while he was on where he's like, no, that's not the true God. We're going to go ahead and imprison them. We're going to capture them. And we're going to kill these people who say that they believe in Jesus. People of the way. In Acts 9, if you can put it up there, <clears throat> Paul was minding his business. He was Saul before, and he says, meanwhile, Saul uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers so he went to the high priest as he was approaching Damascus on the mission he was on a mission y'all on a mission to kill Christians a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him he fell to the ground 
And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then it goes on to say, Saul says, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. <clears throat> he says, now get up. So after he knocks him from his donkey, he was on the way to go kill some Christians. He knocks him down. He has this conversation with him. And then he tells him, hey, get up, go into the city. And you will be told what you must do. I like that. Because, see, a lot of the times we give our lives to Christ and God is telling you what to do. What is God telling you to do? Instantly, some something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Instantly. I love, I love the language that when you give the Lord to, to God, he says, immediately, instantly. And then again, immediately, he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is, remember, because he was saying, this isn't the Christ, this isn't the Messiah, that's why we're going to kill believers. But then he, was, he had a revelation of who Jesus really was and who he is. And then he said, indeed, he, he is the Son of God. <clears throat> and I love that it uses this language like immediately, suddenly. You see, some of us have, have given our lives to Jesus, but you're still waiting on something. Can I just encourage you today? You don't have to wait on anything. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what that speaks to in your life, but you, you, you're waiting to do something for God. And here, and you say, I'm disqualified. I, I don't know about you, but if you're in here, it's because you probably haven't killed somebody. Because now you'd be locked up. This is a guy who would kill people who was possibly one of the worst of the worst. And what God did is he took his life, he had an encounter with God, and he transformed him immediately, suddenly, instantly. And in those, and in those moments, Paul made a decision. See, sometimes what it takes, God has already done his part. Sometimes it takes your part to make the decision. See, God always acts, but we need to respond there's a response that comes from the believer. And then sometimes we take too long to respond to what God is asking us to do. God might be telling you to serve. God might be telling you to give. God might be telling you to forgive. God might be telling you to obey. God might be telling you to drop some stuff. God is always telling you something. We are the ones who take too long to make a decision to obey God's word. And Paul's the one like suddenly, immediately, instantly. He's on the way to kill Christians. And God kicks him off his donkey. And he's blind for three days. And the rest, I don't read it, but the rest of the story, and Ananias, Ananias, he tells Ananias in a dream. And he says, hey, I'm going to tell you, you got to go to Paul. You got to pray for him. And he's going to receive the Holy Spirit. And he, the, the Bible says that he is going to be my vessel and my tool to preach the gospel. And then Aeneas is like, I'm not going to do that. He might kill me. He's like, I've already transformed him. He's blind and he's having a moment with me in Damascus. I need you to go and trust me. He goes, lays hands on him. That's when the scales fall off. And immediately he goes to preach the gospel. Immediately. This is what happens when you know Jesus. When you know him. See, you, you can really tell who knows Jesus. Who, and I know there's a journey. Like, we, we're going to give grace. You're like, oh, dang, I know Jesus for one day. My life doesn't look like Paul's. No, your life is not going to look like Paul's. But we want to encourage you to move forward in your faith. We want to encourage you that your faith should show fruit, that there should be evidence to your faith, that there should be evidence to the fact that you've been transformed by Jesus. In other words, your life shouldn't look the same as it was before Jesus. But it, it is a process. Sometimes things happen gradually. You change gradually. It's, it's more difficult for others. And sometimes it happens quickly. I know my wife always says this testimony about me, and I'm not trying to, but my life is the best life that I know because it's my life. <laughs> but when God saved me <clears throat> and he, he transformed my life, things happen immediately because I just, I didn't know there was a God who loved me. I didn't know there was a God who was so good. I didn't know there was a God that can forgive all my mess and my junk and everything that I did. 
I, di I didn't know. So when I came to the realization of like, man, the, uh, the, the God in heaven that I was kind of afraid of and scared of and thought like if I didn't obey and I was going to go to hell, if I put my faith in him, you mean I'm going to have eternity with him, that I can have peace with God, that he's going to forgive all my past and my present sins, even the ones that I'm going to commit in the funeral? You're talking about that God? That's a real God? That's the God that I serve? Who sign me up? I'll sign it right now. I'll sign, I'll sign away my life right now with interest. And that's the, that's the life that, that Paul's talking about. So much so that in verse 7, when he has this, he says this. He says, whatever were gains to me, not, to me, I now consider it a loss. So he's talking about all that. He's like the Hebrew Hebrews as a Pharisee. You know, I was a pure blood. All these things. Uh, me knowing the Bible back and front. He knew the Bible. He memorized the Bible. The Old Testament. The beginning of the, the Torah. But he didn't know Jesus. He knew it so much, but it was just all intellectual. There was no experience. There was no relationship. It was just all up here. It was head knowledge. And he's like, everything that I knew, everything that was a gain, I now consider it a loss for the sake of Christ. <clears throat> In verse 8, he says, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing, which is what we read, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, for whose sake I have lost all things. I lost it all. He says, I consider them as garbage, as rubbish. Now, this Greek word, translate garbage and rubbish in other versions, translates to cow dung, poop, if you don't know what dung is. <clears throat> He says, that's what I consider it. He says, and to be found in him. He says, and then go to verse 10. Before we get into that, he considers everything, everything, that he, if you have a column in your life, like these are all my wins and these are all my losses, Paul, what he did is he swapped those. Everything that I thought was a gain, everything that I thought was a W, he's like, all this is a loss. And over here now, which is again, is just Jesus in this column. Amen. That's all it is. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. All my accomplishments. You ever meet somebody? They're like, hey, what's going on? My name is Peter. Hey, my name is John. Hey, nice to meet you, John. How are you? What's your name? I mean, well, he already said his name. But he's like, where are you from? No, I'm from, I'm from you know, um, I don't know, I'm from Boston. Oh, man, that's great, man. Cool. What is it that you do? Well, I have a master's, you know. Uh, got a PhD, I got a SMH, I got a LOL, I got a, <laughs> I got a HEB, <laughs> I own all of them, you know, no big deal, and they just start like, you know, you're like, uh, and then when you, they go to you, you're like, I graduated from Mac High, <laughs> I got a high school diploma, <laughs> <laughs> and Paul was that guy like man I, this is all I, I got all this and he's like man everything all my accomplishments everything that you're proud of not that it's not education is great you need it but he's like compare we're talking about comparing to Christ right. nothing compares to Christ yeah. nothing Nothing. <clears throat> I need education. I need my wife. I need my kids. You know, I need friends. I need family. I, I, I need food. But nothing compares to Christ. Nothing compares to Christ. Verse 10 says, he goes on to say, he's like, man, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. Because he knew about what the word said. And he was standing him right in the face, and he, was, and he didn't know that was him. God had to knock him down. He's like, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his res resurrection. This word know is an interesting word, know. When the Bible says in, in most occasions like this about knowing Christ, it's the Greek word gnosko. And when, and when this Greek word is the same word that is used in the beginning when Adam says that he knew Eve. And when the Bible says that he knew Eve... Is means that he was, he was with her intimately. I knew Eve and we had a son. 
And so it's talking about an intimate relationship. When it talks about knowing Christ, when it talks about knowing God, when it talks about knowing your Savior, the Bible relates it to an intimate, personal relationship experience. That, and the Paul's like, I want to know God that way. I want to know him so intimately. Uh, uh, in, other, in other words, to know somebody intimately, you got to spend time with them. Amen. To know somebody intimately, you know, you got you, you, you to know God intellectually through his word. You got to know God through experiences like this. You know, I love experiences because those are moments that create movements. It, you can get with God in a moment like this, but it's not just for the moment. This moment right here is supposed to create a movement for your life, a transformative work in your life. It's supposed to create something in your life that shows fruit and transformation when you're in a moment with God. And then also practical, practically, we got to know God intellectually. We got to know God through experiences. And we also got to know God practically. How is practically look? That is not just at this moment on Sunday, but no, practically is daily. That I got to know God daily. That I just don't know God on a Sunday. It's like pastor was talking about, hey, man, we come in this place and it's wild and it's rocking and it's music and it's blasting. You know, it's different because I came from Catholic church. The first time I walked into the Christian church, I was like, whoa, I, uh, I got scared. <laughs> Seventh grade, got scared. I'm never going back there again. God's like, I got different plans for you. <laughs> then five years later, coincidence, number of grace find myself back in the church giving my life to God. But God wants you to get with him on a, on a daily basis. To know Christ means to have a personal relationship with him through faith. And I say through faith because it's, it's, it's a faith walk. It's a walk. What is faith? We walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, that's why sometimes our life can be frustrating because you're trusting a God that you cannot see and you don't know your future and you're trusting it over to him. But can I remind you that God holds the universe in the palm of his hand? Amen. That God is big. He's bigger than your problem. He's bigger than your frustration. He's bigger than anything that you are going through. God is a God of the universe. And if God is a God of the universe that keeps everything into motion, that if it would be slightly off, this universe would come crashing down. He holds it in your hands. He can hold your life in your hands. He can hold your marriage in your hands. He can hold your kids in, in his hands. He can hold your job in his hands. He can hold anything in his hands. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that he has your situation under control. He has it under control. He's like, I want to know that God. I want to know that God. And you can stand to your feet. I want to end with verse, with this verse 10. With, it continues to say this. It's like, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power right here, the power of his resurrection. I want to know the power of his resurrection. He's like, I want to know Christ. I want to know who he is. But I want to know the power of his resurrection. You know what resurrection, resurrection is? He's like, I, I, I want to know the power of life. See, because when something is dead, it needs resurrection. Resurrection brings it to life. He's like, I want to know the power of resurrection. What he's trying to say here is that, is that I want to know the power of life. What is the power of life? The power of life is that when there's things that are dead in your life, Paul is saying, hey, I want to know the power of life because I want, I want to experience the power of life. I, I want to experience dead things coming to life. In my life, I want to see it. I want to see your hand at work. I want to see miracles at work. I want to see signs. I want to see wonders. And us as believers, we should want to be like Paul. As a matter of fact, later on, we're not going to read it, but later on, a few verses down, he's like, he says, hey, you need to live your life like, like me. Imitate me. And Paul is saying, hey, if you are going to imitate me, I'm the one who wants to know Christ, and I want to live, and I want to know the power of his resurrection, because there are some things in your life that are dead that need to come to life. 
And the only one that can bring them to life is Jesus. The only one that can bring them to life is his presence. It's his miracle working hand. I want to know the power of his resurrection. What are some things in your life that you feel are might be dead and might be stagnant or, or maybe going nowhere or maybe don't have any joy? What are those things in your life where you can experience the power, power of his resurrection? Another Greek word for power is called dunamis. It comes from the word dynamite. That's incredible. The power of his resurrection. It's, it says dynamite because it's explosive. Because it's loud. It's dynamite it's TNT it's lit it's God's power it's God's power you see maybe it's not dead things that you're trying to be that you're trying to bring to life but maybe maybe the power of his resurrection of his resurrection needs to awaken some things in your life Maybe the power of his resurrection, there's things in your life that are just stagnant and they need to come to life. Maybe you, maybe there's not things that are dead in your life, but maybe you need the power to resist some things in life. That's the power of life. Maybe you need the power of God and the power of his resurrection to operate in your calling. You cannot operate in your calling in your own strength and in your own effort. It needs to be by the power and by the spirit of God. Maybe you need to have the power of resurrection in your life to make decisions. See, because the power of Christ wants to bring you life. It wants to bring you life. It wants to bring you life. Somebody say life. It wants to bring you life. That's why I love the name of our church, Lifeline. It's a lifeline for your life. I don't know about you, but I, I need God. I need God for everything. I need him. I need God. I keep saying I'm going to end, but I'm going to end this time for real, for real. With this verse. We say that all the time, right, Pastor? We got like three endings. Ephesians 3.19. You ever heard of the verse where God says, um, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ever ask, think, or imagine? Remember that verse? It's like, man, woo! That's the God that I serve, the God of exceedingly and abundantly. I, the things that I can't even ask, think, and imagine. I'm being sarcastic. The things that I can't even ask, think, or imagine. Woo, that's my God. But look at what this verse, when you really go into the verse, I love the amp because it explains it to you. If you can put it up there. It says, and that you may come to know. This is the verse right before that verse. That you may come to know practically through experience the love of Christ the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that you may be filled up throughout your being to the fullness of God. It says, so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your life. And then it goes completely filled and flooded with God himself. It's not talking about stuff. It's talking about the fullness of God. The fullness of God and knowing God, having joy in knowing Christ. And then, and then the famous verse that everybody quotes, it says, then when you know him, when you truly are fully satisfied with just him and knowing him and his presence and his fullness, it says, now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do abundantly. Another one says exceedingly more than we can dare ask or think infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, and dreams according to his power at work within us. His power that's working on the inside of us. You see, sometimes we focus about the things that I need to ask and get and this and this. The Bible's saying, hey, if you just know Jesus, if you just know him, everything else is worthless, is garbage, it surpasses everything else. If I just want to be in his fullness, can we sing what we're going to sing? We're going to sing real quick and then we're going to worship together. Can you just sing this out? Dear God, just lift up your hands. Eye closed, please. Lift up the hands lifted. Let's enjoy his presence. God, we just want to know you right now in this moment. We want to know you more. Just, just say that in your mind. Say, God, I want to know you more before asking Shout for anything. Jesus from the mountains, 
Jesus in the streets. Well, I want to know you, God. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus Shout Jesus from the mountains And Jesus in the streets That's who I want to know Jesus in the darkness Jesus. Over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus Come on, the altar's open if you Come worship him if you want to get to know him more intimately. If you want to come and pray, if you need prayer for anything, this space is open. Come on. Come on, we want to meet you, God. God is going to do a work on the inside of all of us today. He's working already on the inside of us. And if there's anybody here who says, you know what? I don't know Jesus. I don't know him as my personal. That's why we call it personal Lord and Savior. He's a personal God. He wants to meet you exactly where you are, mistakes and all, sin and all. That's how we met all of us. And God wants to meet you that way. And if you want to have peace with God, that one day you will be with him in eternity peace if you want to make peace if you feel like God I don't know if I pass I don't know where I'm gonna go this is not to scare you this is to give you a decision to make if you're ready to make the decision if you're ready I want you we never do this we never do this we always just ask you to raise your hand we all pray out loud but I don't know I just feel if you want to be bold today if you want to give your life to God can you raise just raise your hand real quick let me know where you are if you want to give your life to Christ I was gonna call all y'all up but there's too many of y'all um, um, and I don't, we don't want to put you on the spot we just get excited because the reason we exist as a church everything we just did was for that hand raise right there that's it that's it you're like why do you sing why do you preach why do you got people in the sun and serving and cars and greeting and doing all these things why are you building the church why are you wasting all this money why do you give of your money why do you give of your time so people can get into heaven that's it we do all this commotion so people can go to heaven we believe it in our hearts we believe it the reason why this place is packed because a man of God answered the call, and there's plenty of man of God, there's plenty of churches, but our pastor is obedient to the word and to the call in his life. And this church exists because somebody said yes. And then we got a bunch of yeses that said yes to help and build the vision to help people get to heaven. I know it's not, a, we don't talk about it a lot like heaven and hell. 
Because that's why we exist. Oh yeah, but y'all go see The Exorcist at the theater. But y'all don't want to talk about hell. <laughs> Just messing with y'all. The nun. But we're just, just repeat this prayer. I don't want to call you. You know what? If you feel, if you want to, if you decided to give your life to Jesus, if you want, fill that area right there if you want, if you want. Just come on up. We want to celebrate you. That's what we want to do. Just, I know it's a little crazy. If you want. Okay. Eyes closed, head bowed. Let's raise our hands and let's, let's just pray this. Say, dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus that I may know him. I put my faith in him. I ask for the forgiveness of my sins so that I will be with you in eternity. I declare that I need you every day of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, it's all about you. There's a party in heaven. And we're just going to sing a little bit more and then we're going to be able to go eat whatever we want to eat. Amen. Let's worship. Let's be in his presence a little bit more just thanking God for our salvation and just for the privilege of getting to know him to know him I just felt like this wave of thankfulness, this wave of joy and knowing what Christ has done in our lives. Maybe knowing for the first time or being reminded of what we already knew. I just feel such a joy in this place. Would you just sing this out with me? I just feel this stirring up in my spirit. Will you just take a hold of it and just, just get excited for a minute?
Jesus. We are so grateful for the joy of knowing Jesus. Can you tell someone next to you, man, I'm so glad I know Jesus. I'm so glad he's on my side. I'm so glad he's in my life. Can I share something with you? I feel like throughout the world, it is something that has become so known that when the holidays come through, it is just a, a season for a lot of people of sadness and sorrows and, you know, the overwhelming uh, spending and, and depression and so many things that come through. And this week of Thanksgiving, instead of being something beautiful, it becomes something stressful and it becomes, we all become angry and we're screaming at each other and we can't even be in the same line at H-E-B together and traffic gets crazy and everybody's losing it. But you know what? We're going to be different because we know Jesus. And I tell you what, if maybe you have just been in that season of, of coming out here and you haven't really joined in to the scripture in Philippians and the Word of God, can I encourage you to do that? Really trust God. Don't wait for the new year. A lot of, oh, in the new year, I'll start the Bible from Genesis. Up. No, do it tomorrow. I encourage you to do it tomorrow. Our plan is going to drop into our app. It's going to drop into social media and just get into it get into it because the word of God and knowing Jesus is joy and I don't know about you but I need the joy of the Lord in my life every single day and especially this holiday week because we don't even have a turkey and none of the stuff that we need so I'll see you at HB. <laughs> Oh, I just want to say thank you for coming out today. Um, we hope you have an incredible week this week, but I do have a couple of things I want to share. I want to share with you that um, we do have Sozo coming up. And if you don't know what Sozo is and you are a young adult, 19 through 35, we want to let you know that this is a once a month event. What does Sozo mean? It basically means wholeness, wholeness in the mind, wholeness in spirit, just wholeness. We want to live that Sozo life, whole in Jesus, right? So we want you to reserve the date today, November the 30th at 8 p.m. Why do we do it so late? Because we want you to get out of work and kind of refresh and then come out and hang out with us. It's going to be an incredible time. So mark your calendar, November the 30th. We want to see you there. Invite someone. It is going to be a great time. The address did change. So look out for that. We are still downtown Harlingen, but check out that, uh, that new address and head out with us. We want to let you know that we still have a little bit of that merchandise left uh, from our newest drop. So go ahead and get that our miracle series and what else have a wonderful time with your family this week happy thanksgiving tell somebody happy thanksgiving week on the way out enjoy eat feast and don't forget to pray before you guys break bread all right god bless you